All right, good morning. All right, good morning, Instagram Live. There we go. Great to see you, David. And good afternoon, YouTube. Welcome to day 44 of DA with DA. Welcome, everyone. Great to see everyone signing on. There we go. All right. Day 44 of DA with DA. Day 44. I want you to hear that. 44. You know what 44 is, right? 44 is one day before 45. And you know what 45 is, right? 45 is halfway through the 90-day DA with DA challenge. So time is flying. And uh, it's been absolutely incredible. I mean, this is all you need to do. Just, just hold it up and look at that. That's almost equal parts, right? Absolutely amazing. Today we're going to be in chapter 42, a chapter with a one-word title, simply Tradition. Tradition. And we are in for a treat today, a short chapter, just one, two, three, sort of four pages, very short. Um, a few quick announcements, but first, some good mornings and welcomes to everyone. All right, let's see. Who do we have? Uh, Brady, good morning. Lisa, such a beautiful book. I agree. Uh, good morning from Pueblo, says B. Jew. I can't, I'm sorry, it's a difficult one to pronounce. Uh, a, Brother Groschel, great to see you. Um, Shelly, good morning. Rambler Cat says, wonderful, agree. Hello, Andy Wu, Andrew Wu, 956. Tulip for God, yes, I was like, wow, she says, agree. Natasha Clark says, hi, David. Hi, Natasha Clark. Good morning, Cassandra. Great to see you. You must not have had a meeting that conflicted with your appointment with DA with DA. Uh, World Tour says, good morning. Oh, good evening from Kenya says, Blessing Diagbear. That was a hard one for me to pronounce. Great to see you from Kenya. All right, hello, Shelby and JVC007. Louis Luna, good morning. Johannesburg, South Africa. Whoa, hello, Nay Nakes21. Great to see you. All right, look at, whoa, they're just Elise Harbolt. There she is. Thanks to everyone, she says, who posted a picture with the DA with DA hashtag. Elise, I wish you were here, right? If you were here, we could have our back and forth and it would be really great. Um, it was really wonderful to have Elise for three days, five chapters, I think we did together. And uh, I had several people reach out to me and say, wow, it was really great to have um, a woman on the show, a female on the show, uh, on the challenge, and I agree. It was really great. I've known Elise for, for almost 15 years now, and she's wonderful, and I am sad, was sad to have dropped her off at the airport yesterday, but speaking of women, I spent an amazing day with my very favorite woman in the whole world, and that is Violetta, my wife of 22 years. And a big thank you to all of you who wished us a happy anniversary. We had a lovely day. Um, the day, we just basically spent a lot of time together talking and planning and looking over our schedule for the year. Um, and then we went out to dinner with some dear friends of ours. In fact, the people that own this house, we went out for dinner, had Indian food. And uh, the fellow that owns the Indian restaurant, his name is Siraj. And I think he's actually Nepalese himself, but man, the Indian food was good. And um, then we came back and they have a, like a little movie theater in the house here and we watched, um, <laughs> we actually watched a, uh, something that Elise told us about. It's a new PBS program that is basically telling an old, uh, I think it's a fairly old BBC series built around um, this veterinarian, this famous kind of wonderful veterinarian fellow that was an, an Englishman. I think he was actually maybe Scottish. And his name is James Harriet. And they've just released this brand new series, I think this year, 2021, or maybe it was 2020, called All, All Creatures Big and Small, or All Creatures Great and Small. Anyway, we watched, uh, it was, it's really, really good. I didn't even know that they made wholesome television anymore because I don't, I'm not a television watcher, but Elise put us onto it. And uh, we watched uh, two of those episodes last night, and they were fantastic. Um, 
Yeah, they're really, really good. So if, you, if you're not familiar with the series, if you love animals, and Violet and I are both animal lovers, especially birds, as you know. Oh, in fact, oh, just a word about that. If you love animals, it's a great series. All creatures, great and small. Not the old version. I haven't seen the old version. It's from 40 or 50 years ago, I think. But the brand new version is fantastic. Extremely well done. Uh, great scripting. Uh, beautiful cinematography and extremely wholesome. Like, it's really, really good. So anyway, what I was going to tell you is really sad story. Um, the people that own the home that we're in right here, our neighbors were walking along their creek that goes across the property here just yesterday, and they found a dead great horned owl. And there's a pair of great horned owls that have lived down in the creek here for like 10 or more years. And Owls tend to be monogamous. They mate for life or for very long periods of time until a mate dies and then they'll try to find another. And uh, absolutely devastating, one of the female, a, quite a smaller owl, was dead just yesterday. And um, so this morning, uh, Larry, my friend, my neighbor went out hiking and he saw the great big one sitting there. So this would have been the male probably waiting for his female to come back. And I was just... It's devastating, absolutely devastating because the owl's in like perfect condition. You can just see it's laying there. It's not, it's, uh, anyway, really sad. So, um, yeah, welcome to day 42 or D day 44 of DA with DA. Had a wonderful anniversary yesterday. Um, a couple very quick announcements. Number one, there are only six days left to order the DA with DA t-shirts. So if you, I can't wait till I can wear one on the program. So DA with DA t-shirts are available at theconflictbeautiful.com, theconflictbeautiful.com, and then you just click on the shopping tag, and there's two colors, two styles, and the two colors match the two colors of the Desire of Ages and the Conflict Beautiful. So you have kind of a dark gray and then also a really nice red. Um, so that's a limited time offer. It only goes through April 11, I think is the last day. So just a reminder about that. Uh, they're not terribly expensive. I think they're $22 and that includes domestic shipping. So we just basically wanted to keep it extremely inexpensive. We even can ship them internationally, but there is some shipping associated with that. Uh, that's announcement number one. Announcement number two is just a reminder. I received an email this morning from Thompson from Paris Publishing Company. They're the ones that have done the professional quality audiobooks. Apparently, a great number of you have ordered those audiobooks. And just a reminder that they're still running through the whole DA with DA challenge. They're running their special, which I'll, I'll know more about tomorrow. I'll go back and remind myself of exactly what the special is. And I'll put the link in my bio. Um, but those audiobooks are excellent. It's Steps to Christ, Thoughts from the Mount of, Ble Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, um, Desire of Ages, Christ Object Lessons. And I think there's one more that I'm not remembering. And professionally done, they sound amazing. I have them. And uh, so that special is still on there, which I think is, the, if I remember right, it's the whole catalog for $100, something like that. So have a look at it. I'll put the link in the description tomorrow or maybe today. I'll see if I can go locate it. Oh, one final thing. The last DA with DA that we did with Elise on Instagram, it did not record because something went wrong with either our local internet here or the Instagram servers. I don't know what it was but it didn't, it didn't lock it in. But you can, anytime something goes wrong on Instagram, we make a backup copy for my YouTube channel. And um, big shout out to YouTube. When you first sign up for a YouTube channel, you get this like very, you know, sort of esoteric, big, long URL. But Daryl yesterday sort of spoke to YouTube and appealed to them, and we were able to get whatever it is, YouTube forward slash David Asherick. And uh, apparently someone had already secured that name, David Asher, but they weren't using it. It's amazing how many people have YouTube accounts or YouTube channels that are like basically tons and tons of my sermons. So I thought, well, maybe I should get in this game since, you know, I'm him. Um, so they originally weren't going to give us David Asherick. They were going to make... So Daryl, thank you. He reached out to them and said, hey, this is the guy. This is the actual person. Maybe he could have his name. There's an idea. And uh, so they relented. And so thank you, YouTube. All right, that's all we've got for announcements. We are into chapter 42, tradition. We're gonna start as we always do with prayer. Welcome, so glad you are all here. 
Father in heaven, bless us now as we spend some time talking about the increasing tension and conflict between Jesus historically with the religious leaders of his day. And Father, this is a short chapter, but it packs a very powerful punch, a punch that means a lot to us today. And so I pray that you'll just be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, it just occurred to me that I haven't put my little headphones on. Let me see if this works. Let me see if this will work. We get a little better sound with these. Can somebody confirm on Instagram that you can still hear me? Because it says that they're connected. So I'm just going to wait here for a moment to make sure that these sound good. So I'm looking for a thumbs up from Instagram. Waiting. There is a little bit of a lag there. Okay. Okay, yes, yes, amen. Okay, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, Here we go. So we're in... Chapter 42, a chapter with, again, just a one-word title, Tradition, and this chapter is based on two passages, one from Matthew, one from Mark, and unusually, we're going to read the Markan account here, and this begins in Mark chapter 7, verse 1, and we're going to go all the way down. Again, unusually, the Markan account here actually has more detail than Matthew, there are, there are some differences in the account, but enough similarities that you could be absolutely certain that the same situation, same circumstances being described. But we're going to read the Mark account because there are a few details in here that are really important. And one of the things we're going to do today, we haven't done a lot of this, but one of the things that we'll do today is I'll spend some time, some time on, a, on a problematic passage, a passage that has been you know, widely, almost universally misunderstood and misinterpreted that comes right at the end of this section in the Gospel of Mark, verse 19. So we'll spend some time on that and we'll do a little bit of Bible study. Not a lot, because we're basically reading through Desire of Ages and staying on point, but it's just, it would be irresponsible for me not to spend just a moment on verse 19 of Mark chapter seven. So we'll do that a little bit later. So let's read this, Mark chapter seven, beginning in verse one, And it's like 22, 23 verses. Okay, I'll read it through quickly. It says, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding to the tradition of the elders. And that's our chapter title here today. Tradition. Okay? Verse 4. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups and pitchers, copper vessels and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders and eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? Ooh, as it is written, then he quotes from what we would call Uh, Isaiah, I think it's 29. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the command of God, you hold the tradition, there it is, of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition, there it is a fourth time. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother and let... And he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, fifth time, which you have handed down, and many other such things you do. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear me, everyone, and understand There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, are you without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because this is the troublesome verse, verse 19. It's not troublesome, it's just widely misunderstood and misinterpreted. We'll come back to that later, but let me just read it. Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. 
And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a man or a woman. They defile a person. Okay, so, so in both the Mark 7 account and the Matthew 15 account, you really have two, two points of conflict. And one is surrounding this thing called Corban, which was this tradition about reserving your, your monies for the temple and not giving them to your parents, not giving that money that, that you could have used to support and assist your parents to them. That's number one. And the number two is the washing Continual washing of things, the washing of hands, the washing of cups and pitchers and copper vessels and couches even. So those are the two things that are in play here, both in Matthew 15 and in Mark 7. And so with that in mind, let's go to Desire of Ages chapter 42. I'm going to keep Mark open here because we will reference it several times. But you can see why this chapter is called tradition, right? Five times tradition, 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 tradition comes up over and over again, and thus the chapter is titled Tradition. That would have been the low-hanging fruit, the easy single word to have chosen for this chapter, and it would have been a totally legitimate word, right? The title of the chapter is Tradition, and if your word to describe the chapter was Tradition, totally fine. That would make sense. I actually went with a little different word, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but let's just get into this. I'm going to start by reading paragraph one, which further sets the table And um, I thought this was a short but very punchy chapter, and uh, it's suggestive, and we'll talk about how it's suggestive in a little bit. Okay, reading paragraph one, it says, the scribes and Pharisees expecting to see Jesus at the Passover had laid a trap for him. Ah, this first paragraph has a significant amount of intrigue, right? There's the idea of the laying of a trap and spies are sent out to watch his every move, to try to find some thing that they could accuse him, right? So the tension is escalating. The conflict is increasing. I mean, no doubt the reports that Jesus had fed the 5,000 men, well, you know, 10 or 12,000 people probably with just a few loaves and fishes and the the sense, and she actually talks about this in the first paragraph, which I'll read in just a moment, but the sense that, that there was an effort, a popular effort to try and make him king Well, all of that would have leaked back to the religious leaders in and around Judea, even as far away as Jerusalem. And so there's like, what is going on up there in Galilee? We need to send a deputation of spies out. Go and see what's going on. Now, they also no doubt would have heard about the very problematic, unusual speech that Jesus gave in the synagogue in Capernaum about, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And remember... This was interpreted by and understood by a great many of the people that were following Jesus up to that point with worldly hopes and ambitions, worldly desires, nationalistic desires. This was understood by them to be a forthright announcement by Jesus that he was not the Messiah. Of course, he didn't say that, but that's how they interpreted it. So so these mixed messages are coming into the ears of the religious leaders, again, throughout Judea and Galilee, as far away as Jerusalem. And they need to, you know, in the pre-internet pre-cell phone, pre-technological you know technological days, they needed to get their hands on it. They needed to understand what was going on. And so they send a deputation of people up there. Hey, go up there, find out what's going on with this guy. See if you can observe anything. Is there anything that we can get him on to further decrease his popularity and his standing with the people? Because remember, as we've encountered several times, the real concern here with the religious leaders is not truth. I want to say that again. The real concern with the religious leaders is not the pursuit of truth or of Jesus' messianic identity, prospective messianic identity. The real concern here is, hey, we're losing influence. That was the concern with John the Baptist, right? And now that's the concern with Jesus. We're losing influence. We're losing popularity. So they send some people up there to see if they can find anything to further accuse and thus decrease his influence and popularity. They think, oh, maybe this is our moment. We're going to strike while the iron is hot. Okay, so that's the first sentence. Let me just read it again. I'll read the whole paragraph. The scribes and Pharisees expecting to see Jesus at the Passover, right? Because they're thinking, I I just cannot talk without comment. I can't read without comment. They're thinking that again, we've already talked about how Passover was a period of heightened 
nationalism and heightened awareness of the subjugation that they experience day after day, month after month, year after year, under the hated Romans. And so they're thinking, oh, if, the, if he's going to make his move, remember, they're projecting onto him their own motives, their own thinking. Oh, so, so he's going to probably show up at Passover and try and make a big splash and rally the people to his cause that he's lost while he gave that unusual speech in the synagogue in Capernaum. They're projecting, and people do this, onto him, their own motivations, their own thinking, and yet Jesus is coming from a totally different place, of course. And so they're gonna lay a trap for him. Second sentence now. But Jesus, knowing their purpose, had absented himself from the gathering. Oh, okay, well, that was unexpected. He didn't show up. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, As he did not go to them, they came to him. For a time, it had seemed that the people of Galilee would receive Jesus as the Messiah and that the power of the hierarchy in that region would be broken. Fascinating. Okay, again, remember, in the north, in Galilee, up around Capernaum and to the north of the Sea of Galilee, there was a sense that, whoa, Jesus could have, if he would have wanted to, he could have capitalized on the popularity, the rising tide of popularity, and he could have, announced himself as Messiah, and he would have been received, and very likely there would have been a trickle-down effect all the way down south, even perhaps to Jerusalem itself. But he's not done this, and the religious leaders, they don't understand. You know, he's got the opportunity. The iron is apparently hot. Why doesn't he strike? Why doesn't he make his move? And uh, then the next sentence I thought was fascinating. The mission of the 12, remember it was just a few, par- a few chapters ago, he sends out the 12 to go labor by themselves, to prepare the way, and then they came back and reported to him. Now listen to this, fascinating sentence. The mission of the 12, indicating the extension of Christ's work and bringing the disciples more directly in conflict with the rabbis, had excited anew the jealousy of the religious leaders at Jerusalem. This is key. We've already talked about the importance of numbers and Jesus' selection of 12 disciples and sending them out. This would have been perceived by his self-styled enemies as a move to further increase his influence and to try and make his move, right? And this would have brought them increasingly into conflict with the religious leaders of the day. And so they thought, ah, okay, okay, we see what's going on here. So we need a spy. We need to send people out to try and catch him in something. So then next sentence, the spies they sent to Capernaum in the early part of his ministry had tried to fix on him the charge of Sabbath breaking. We covered that in the chapter on the Sabbath. Remember, your disciples are harvesting. They're doing that which isn't lawful on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And he reminds them of the story of David who ate the showbread in the temple. You remember that. So they've already tried this tack, okay? They've already attempted this. It says, but the rabbis were bent on carrying out their purpose. Now another deputation was sent to watch his movements and find some accusation against him. So the intrigue, the intrigue is increasing. The intensity is increasing. The the conflict is increasing. And Jesus is not moving according to the way that they would have expected or thought or assumed because, again, they're projecting their own motivations and their own desires for popularity, for standing with the people, for status as religious leaders onto Jesus. But Jesus is doing a whole nother thing. I'm going to read the second paragraph as well. As before, the ground of complaint was his disregard of the traditional precepts that encumbered the law of God. I don't know if you underline that word, but that word should be underlined. That's that's a key word here, encumbered. These traditional precepts, these rabbinical expectations that surrounded, barricaded the law of God, encumbered it. They were supposed to be protecting it ostensibly, but they actually encumbered it, they obfuscated it, they made things less clear and, well, less principled, we're gonna get to that in just a second, than they were designed by Yahweh to be when he gave the law from Sinai. Okay, encumbered the law of God. These were professedly designed to guard the observance of the law, but they were regarded as more sacred than the law itself. When they came in collision with the commandments given from Sinai, preference was given to the rabbinical precepts. Okay, one more here. Among the observances most strenuously enforced was that of ceremonial purification. A neglect of the forms to be observed before eating was accounted a heinous sin to be punished both in this world and in the next. So in the Markan account, 
you get the sense that there were a great number of these rules and that participation in, or at least making every effort to keep these rules was required if you wanted to be a Jew in good and regular standing. So these rules, these requirements, these strictures were established by the religious people in order to kind of keep people reined in, ostensibly, supposedly, from breaking the law of God. But the point that's happening in this chapter is that actually the law of God be, began to be eclipsed. The law of God was eclipsed by these traditions, by these strictures, by these precepts, and not only eclipsed, but you actually ended up finding that these, these boundaries around the law of God created opportunities for the violation of the law of God. And that's the point that Jesus is going to make here. Again, we have two issues the ceremonial purification and the washing of hands and cups and pitchers and couches. That's one. And then also this issue of what was called Corbin. Now in the Mark and account, the Corbin thing comes first. Well, actually it kind of goes the washing of things, then the Corbin thing, then back to the washing of things. Um, so let's start with, I, I'm going to read that next paragraph there because there's a couple lines here that are crucial. I already mentioned this. The rules in regard to the purification were numberless. There were lots of them. And you get that sense in the Mark and account. They did lots of things, he says, and many other such things they do, right? The washing not only of hands, but of pitchers and of vessels and of couches, even places where you sit. And, and we should probably just note here that a big part of this, a big part of the reason for all of these numberless restrictions was to create distinction between us as God's chosen covenant people, the Jewish nation, and them, the Gentiles, us and them. The whole world of a, of a first century Jew was divided into, was perceived in terms of us as God's chosen covenant people and them, non-Jewish people, a large you know, supposedly monolithic entity, all of them, right? And so one of the ways that they did that is they had the notion or the idea of purification, ceremonial purification. So we've talked about this several times before, how Jesus again and again and again in varied circumstances never gives any indication that he is in the least bit concerned or fearful of being contaminated or becoming ceremonially unpure, impure. We've seen this again and again. He touched a leper and he touched the coffin and he grabbed the hand of the dead little girl that Jesus said was only sleeping. The woman who had an issue of blood touched him. Uh, Jesus sat very proximate to and discussed with the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus went to a party of tax collectors and other outcasts of first century Jewish society. Jesus affirmed in the strongest possible language a Roman centurion and said that he'd not seen faith such as, you know, so great as this in the whole of Israel. So clearly, 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 Jesus is not playing by the rules. He's just not playing by the rules. He shows no signs, no worry, no, worry, no concern about ceremonial, ritual, social impurity or contamination. Okay? Now, why? Well, because these rules and strictures about contamination were basically designed to create a, a buffer space between us, the chosen covenant people of God, and them, the uncircumcised, unclean, godless Gentiles. But, but Jesus has no sense of that buffer, right? Jesus will speak easily and freely with Samaritans and Gentiles and lepers. There is no buffer for Jesus. I've said this again, I'll say it again. The central critique of Jesus by the religious leaders of his day was this man receives sinners and eats with them. Luke chapter 15, verse two. Okay, so Jesus is again conducting himself in ways that were radically revolutionary and dissimilar to the religious leaders of his day, particularly with regards to the social ease and affability and the fact that he was just willing to be around people, different kinds of people, because he saw in every person a candidate for the kingdom. He didn't make these you know, differentiations based on class or dress or even genealogy. Jesus mingled. We've seen that word over and over and over again. Mingling, 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 freely moving in diverse groups. Okay, so now they're like, you know what? We need to, we need to raise this issue with Jesus. And the opportunity came with regards to the washing of hands. And um, she says there in that next paragraph, they did not, however make a direct attack on Christ. 
This is very much like the chapter on the Sabbath where the accusation was against Jesus' disciples. And there is a, there's a subtlety to this because when you attack the disciples, you're basically saying you're a bad teacher, right? Like if you attack the students, you're not just saying, oh, the students are bad or the students are you know, unlearned or uninitiated, but you've done a bad job instructing them. That's the Im- implied critique here. Right, because remember they said, why do your disciples, you know, thresh grain and eat on the Sabbath? And here they're saying, why don't your disciples? So the, the point here, because, because Jesus himself actually also didn't do this. Listen to that first sentence there. Christ and his disciples did not observe these ceremonial washings. So the accusation was there to be had against Jesus if they wanted to. They could have said, hey, why don't you? Why don't you wash your hands? Why don't you purify before partaking of food? But there's a little dig, an even stronger dig, when you say, why don't your disciples do this? Then it's like, you're a delinquent teacher. You're uninitiated. You you don't know what you should be teaching. And then, of course, implicit under that is, you should come and learn from us how to do it right. And remember, remember, just remember, back when John the Baptist was baptizing, There was even debate and dispute among the religious leaders about exactly what the baptism of John meant. Like it was, it was clearly, I mean, anybody that's ever seen a baptismal service gets the basic idea. You go into the water, you come up, you're washed, you're cleansed, you're new. But the debate and the dispute was, well, in what sense are they washed? In what sense are they new? And even the suggestion that at some level Jewish people had to participate in that level of a purification was kind of like, remember John the Baptist rebukes them, says, who invited you to come, right? Who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Bring forth, you know, uh, deeds and works that are meet, that are, that are up to repentance. So this question of contamination and purification was a major question. Notice she says here, um, She's, I'll just listen to this sentence. This is in that paragraph, just one paragraph back. The life of those who tried to observe the rabbinical requirements was one long struggle against ceremonial defilement, an endless round of washings and purifications. One long struggle. A great big long struggle. And so now the question is put to Jesus. Jesus, why aren't you instructing your disciples correctly? Why aren't you doing what you should be doing? You're a, doing. You're a delinquent teacher. You have... You have fallen short of your responsibility as a rabbi, as a religious leader, clearly as is evidenced in the behavior of your disciples. Now, this is very interesting here. Ellen White, which she often does, and I've made this point, she'll just shift away from the seen to the unseen. For Ellen White, the veil that separates the seen world, the material world that we all exist in, the world of time and space, and the world of angels and principalities and powers and God and even Satan, that world, that is a very thin line. It's a thin veil. And so she will just easily transition seamlessly back and forth from the seen to the unseen. And she does this in the next paragraph, the paragraph that begins, whenever the message of truth comes, listen to this, whenever, okay, just somebody trying to give me a phone call there. Um, Whenever the message of truth comes home to souls with special power, Satan, there it is, she just drops it in, stirs up his agents to start a dispute over some minor question. Okay, so again, this is very um, typical of Ellen White's writings, that, that she will see a for instance, and then she'll pan out and give the larger great controversy motif. God is about ready to do something big. Satan stirs up his agents over what she calls some minor question to try and derail the thing that God is about ready to do, okay? And she makes this point over and over in the book. Um, Then she says the same kind of thing again. Whenever a good work is begun, there are cavillers ready to enter into dispute over forms or technicalities to draw away minds from the living realities. Okay, okay. You should have under, I mean, I would advise you to underline that because she makes a purposeful contrast there with form, she says, with forms or technicalities as distinct from living realities. Okay, the for instance of that is this Corbin thing. Okay, so I'm just gonna turn the page. We'll come back there. 
But I'm going to turn the page. There's a lengthy paragraph that begins with, Jesus made no attempt to defend himself. We'll come back to that in just a second. But I want you to hear this. This is where the whole idea of Corbin, which was the idea of a gift, right? I don't have to support my parents, my aging parents, perhaps my infirmed or otherwise incapacitated parents, because I've get, I'm reserving my money either to give in the here and now to the temple, or I want to reserve my money so that when I die, all of it goes to the temple. And it was basically an opportunity to defraud your parents and the command to honor your father and your mother. And it was a religious loophole in order to basically be selfish. So it had the pretense of religiosity, but in essence, it was violating the very command of God, the fifth commandment, commandment honor your father and your mother, that, the, that your days may be long by the land which the Lord your God gives you. Okay, so, so now this is interesting. Remember, she just made that contrast between, how did she say it? Forms and technicalities and living realities. Well, check this out. Parents that are alive and in need are living realities. Okay? So she, she gives that contrast between forms and technicalities as opposed to prioritizing living realities. And then just what? Two paragraphs later, she gives a good example of this. And I want to read this because I really like this. So again, it's that I'm on page 460 of the Types and Symbols, 397 of the original. A lengthy paragraph that begins, Jesus made no attempt to defend himself. And about halfway down that paragraph, we encounter this. Um, Jesus quoting them says, but you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me, whatever benefit financial that you might have received from me as your child is now Corbin, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother. Now watch this. They set aside the fifth commandment as of no consequence, but were very exact in carrying out the traditions of the elder, elders. They taught the people that devotion of their property that, to the temple was a duty more sacred than even the support of their parents. And again, parents are living realities. Okay, do you see what's happening here? She continues. Even more uh, important than the, the support of their parents. And that however great the necessity, it was sacrilege to impart to father or mother any part of what had thus been consecrated. An undutiful child had only to pronounce the word Corbin over his property. Talk about a technicality. Do you see? So she says that basically what was happening here was the prioritization of a technicality over a living reality. And what Ellen White is saying in this paragraph here is that all you had to do was say, Corbin, this is Corbin, and then you are all of a sudden screened from having to assist your parents that were in need. And this was an absolute nullifying and setting aside of the command of God to honor your father and your mother. She continues. I want to read the rest of this paragraph. An undutiful child had only to pronounce the word Corbin over his property, thus devoting it to God, and he could retain it for his own use during his lifetime. Ah, wink, wink, nod, nod looking spiritual, but actually being deeply carnal and selfish. He could retain it for his own use during his lifetime, and after his death, it would be appropriated to the temple service. Thus, he was at liberty, both in life and in death, to dishonor, there's the key word, and defraud his parents under cover of a pretended devotion to God. Bingo, we have a winner. Okay, so let's put all these pieces together. Jesus' popularity is on the rise, but it has taken a bit of a hit with that unusual speech that he gave in the synagogue in Capernaum. So spies are sent, and they're looking for some point of critique, some way to, to capitalize on Jesus' perhaps diminishing popularity. And so they say, oh, we got an idea. This guy doesn't wash. This guy doesn't participate in the, the traditions of the elders, and neither do any of his disciples. So they raise this critique. And by the way, did you notice that the critique begins with the word why. Why? Okay, I'm just gonna read it to you here. It says to them, then I'm in Mark chapter seven, verse five. Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, why, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with unwashed hands? Why? Now, what's very interesting in the, the Matthew account is that Jesus' answer, in fact, I'll just read it to you here. It'll just take me two seconds to find it. I want you to hear this. Jesus answers their why question with a why question, okay? So now I'm in Matthew chapter seven, 
excuse me, Matthew chapter 15, verse three. He answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded saying, honor your father and your mother, but you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me, it is a gift of God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition, hypocrites. And then he says, then he quotes Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied well of you when he said, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is in the wrong place. Now, a a few things here. First of all, when they're asking the question why, they honestly don't, they don't know the answer. They, they, They have no frame of reference to understand why it is that Jesus does the things he does and does not do the things he doesn't do. I mean, in their minds, when Jesus had that opportunity, you know, to be pronounced king, to receive massive popularity, this groundswell of enthusiasm, every one of them would have capitalized on that, right? Because they're actuated by a certain kind of motivation, and so they assume that Jesus is too. Just press pause on that. Remember, remember, remember that we made this really great point in in the temptation when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, and this had never occurred to me, never occurred to me even one time until this passed through DA with DA, and that's what's so great about it. Right, you get these new insights. But remember this, that two of the temptations is that Satan took Jesus up. He took him up to the pinnacle of the temple, looking down on everybody. He took him up to, Scripture says, an exceedingly high mountain, looking down on everyone. What's happening here? Jesus knows that he's come not to look down on people. He already had that prerogative and position when he was God in heaven. He's come down to sit across from them, but here's the key. Satan has projected onto Jesus his own character and motivations. That's what's happening here. They're saying, hey, this was the perfect opportunity for this guy to have capitalized on his increasing popularity and success. Why didn't he do it? So when they say why, they are genuinely confused. Jesus moves and acts and speaks and behaves in ways that they have no frame of reference for because they're not actuated by the same things that actuate. What's Jesus actuated by? Love, service, support, ministry, mercy, forgiveness. This is why, again, when in the Sabbath chapter, the people came to Jesus and said, hey, your disciples are breaking the Sabbath. Of course, they weren't breaking the Sabbath, but by the rabbinical traditions and rules they were. Jesus says, go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Quoting Hosea 6.6 6 with an implication of Micah 6, 6 to 8. Go learn what this means. In other words, when Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 8 says, he has shown you, O man, what is good, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's all internal. That's all internal motivation. It's not just external correspondence, external cooperation with a bunch of rules and regulations. So back to the point here. When they say why, they really don't know the answer. They're not actuated by the same motives and principles that Jesus is actuated by. And so they are legitimately mystified by Jesus' actions, his words, his temperament, his choice of company. Fascinating. So so back to the point here. The law of God had been set aside, in this case, the fifth commandment, for what did she call them, technicalities, forms and technicalities. So you have living, breathing parents made in the image of God that had given birth to this man or this woman who had every right to expect, hey, listen, (laughs) I'll tell you a cute little thing about my own family. So I have two of the most amazing sons. In fact, I woke up this morning to a beautiful text from my oldest son, Landon, in Australia. And uh, he just gives, he sends updates on on his grades and on his daily activity. I mean, I could not be happier with both Landon and Jabel. They are the, they're my best friends and my, some of my closest companions in the world. I love them. I love them with every ounce of my being. And the fact that they are the composite of Violetta and I's love is amazing, right? Life is amazing. Love is amazing. Children is amazing. God is amazing. We have so much to be thankful for. But, but the idea that, that, Landon is, Landon and Jabel have just grown into these wonderful young men, like 18 and 19, that truly 
honor their parents. They love their parents. They value what we say. We're not forced to say, hey, don't you forget and you'd better. Voluntarily, they respond in such beautiful and, and Christian ways toward us, which I'm just so honored to have such amazing sons. Well, here's the point. When my children were younger, <laughs> and they would occasionally, like all kids, you know, or sometimes frequently, be disobedient or act up and they needed to be disciplined. I think I got this from my dad, my, my adoptive dad, Richard Asherick. Um, I could tolerate quite a little bit. And I was a, fairy, a fairly firm parent, but I like to think a reasonable parent and somebody who would explain. But I didn't tolerate foolishness. And there was one thing I could not tolerate. I just, I mean, I just couldn't handle it. I have a very high threshold for temper. I don't lose my temper. I think Violetta's seen me lose my temper five times maybe in 22 years. It's just not a thing that I do. But there was one thing that the boys could do that would really fire me up. And that was disrespect their mother. And I think I got this from my adoptive dad. When I would speak in a disrespectful way about my mother, oh, my dad was not having it. And he spent more than 30 years in the U.S. military. He, he knew how to take charge of a situation. I mean, he ended up as a major in the United States Air Force and went through the enlisted and then became an officer. And he knew, he knew that there were things you could and could not do. And I learned real quick that, that disrespecting mom was not on the menu. Not cool. Not cool. Well, I've taken that on board. And actually, I didn't even, like, I didn't even do it intentionally. I just would feel that when my sons, when they were younger, when they would do or say something that was disrespectful to their mother, oh, it would light me up. And I hope I, I, hope I don't get in trouble for saying this. But I used to say to my boys, when they, if they would act up in this way, which didn't happen often, but it did happen, I would say, boys, Boys, come here right now. Listen to me. Listen to me right now. Do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? This woman carried you in her body. This woman had major surgery in order to bring you into the world. This, this woman right here, when, when you would be crying in the night or when you needed food, she would feed you at her own body. She would hold you. She would rock you. She would take care of you. This is a woman when you would, when you would, poop all over yourself or pee, she would clean you, she would wash you. This is a woman who has devoted her life to you as her children. You will never speak to her that way in my home. And they would just, and I, I would get even more fired up than that. I just wouldn't tolerate it. To me, it was just un, absolutely, totally unacceptable to have a child disrespecting the very one that had done so much for them. And, and happily today, you know, all children go through those periods of up and down and testing the boundaries and trying to figure out. I had lovely children, children that required discipline like all children. But now at ages 18 and 19, I can say that my two boys, the way they love their mother, the way they respect their mother, the way they care for their mother, it's actually a beautiful thing. And I'm not exaggerating. It's a beautiful thing. Well, that's kind of what's at stake here, right? Like the idea that a child could just disregard his or her parents in the name of religion? Yeah, no. So Jesus is like that fired up parent. He's like, okay, 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 okay. And he actually throws out the H word. Did you notice that? He just drops the H word right into the middle of the conversation. Hypocrite. And the word hypocrite, if you look it up, says it means actor. This is all pretend. This is all farcical. This is a giant show. It's a play. Your inner heart is not being transformed by the love of God, the law of God, the mercy of God. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. But you've got all of these external technicalities by which you are shown to be in compliance with traditions. And Jesus says, yeah, nah, no, no. Because remember, Jesus is the one who established this whole idea of sexual reproduction and Two, the two become one and they give birth to a child and there's this incredibly intimate, wonderful, love-based connection between children and parents and it's beautiful and it's amazing and as somebody who has a, an incredible wife of 22 years and two sons that I love with every ounce of my being, when you're in it, it's just such a blessing. It's such a beautiful thing and Violetta has you know, two brothers and two sisters and I have two brothers and two sisters and she loves her parents and I love my parents and she loves her siblings and I love my siblings. And when you're in that close family connection, it's a beautiful thing. And so a violation of it, something that cuts across the grain of God's 
good intention. Remember, God's world was a good, 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 very good world. And a big part of that very good world was the family unit. Something that cuts across the grain of God's intention for parents caring for their children and children later caring for their parents in the name of religion, the religion of Yahweh, and to support the temple so that it could be no, no, Jesus says, no. He says, you guys are just like Isaiah said. You draw near to me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. He was fired up. He was not having a bar of it. He was not going to tolerate this perversion of the religion of Judaism to screen and even affirm behavior that ran directly contrary to God's Ten Commandment law. Okay? You feel that's what's at stake here. So um, I want to just get back one paragraph there because, or maybe it's two paragraphs, back to page 459. There's a point here that's so good we can't miss it. Um, This is where she's talking about forms and technicalities versus living realities. And then listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. Um, Not that sentence, this sentence. The questions that concern The questions that most concern us are, and she gives two questions. Do I believe with saving faith on the Son of God? Do I believe with saving faith on the Son of God? Question number one. Question number two. Is my life in harmony with the divine law? She said, those are the questions at stake here. Then she quotes, he who believes in the Son of God has everlasting life, and he who does not believe shall not see life. Okay, remember that our last chapter, our word was believe. Believe, 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 believe. Because they come to Jesus after the feeding of the 5,000 plus the women and children and they say, what works must we do that we can work the work of God? And Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. And that was my word for the chapter. Believe, believe. And here, she says that these are the questions that should concern us. Not all these forms, not all these technicalities, not this deep, what what does she call it? A long struggle against ceremonial defilement. We got two questions to ask ourselves. Question number one, do I believe with saving faith on the Son of God? Question number two, is my life in harmony with God's divine law of love? That's the stuff that we should care about. But what had happened in Jesus' day was all of that was being supplanted with these forms and technicalities that, again, to add insult to injury, basically existed to create a buffer of purity between us, God's covenant people, and them, the unholy, uncircumcised, godless Gentiles. And all of this is such a perversion, such a radical departure from God's intent for Israel Ellen White says things like, it was painful to Jesus. It's painful to me. Painful to see that God's intention in giving the truth to Abraham and his descendants was that it would be given to the world, back to that initial embryonic Abrahamic promise. And now all of those rules are being multiplied so that the principles are being lost sight of. And the point is separation from those kinds of people, the very people that Jesus was spending most of his time in social settings with. It was painful to Jesus. And so he says, you're hypocrites. This is all a play. This is all a a drama. This is all an act. Whoa, whoa. They had laid a trap for Jesus, but in the act of laying a trap, they had in in the words of Proverbs chapter 26, verse 27, they had dug a pit for someone else and fallen into it themselves. They had dug a pit for Jesus and then Jesus They said, why do you? Jesus says, why do you? And that pit that they had dug, that trap, they themselves fell into it. And Jesus pulls no punches here. He pulls out the H word. I also loved this line very quickly. Next paragraph, Jesus made no attempt to defend himself. Just very briefly on that. Jesus made no attempt to defend himself. Remember, in the chapter that we just had before this, there were questions about the allegedly dubious nature of Jesus' birth. Hey, how can this guy say he came down from heaven? This is Joseph's son. This is the son of Mary. And there were these suggestions about the dubious nature of his birth. And yet this, yet this, she says, uh, I think I wrote it down here, on page 446 of Types and Symbols, let me just tell you that in the, in the original pagination that is page um, 
387, is that right? 387, this is key. In neither case does Jesus defend himself. And I want you to feel that. And I need to hear that. I need to hear that. That when trolls are trolling, and when accusers are accusing, and when spies are spying, don't defend yourself. Don't defend yourself. Right? Because in defending yourself, you're actually legitimizing the you're legitimizing the game that they're playing. Now, Jesus, is, Jesus doesn't even dignify the accusation with a response. Listen to this again. Jesus made no attempt to defend himself or his disciples. He made no reference to the charges against him. And I absolutely love that. We live in a world increasingly of, particularly in the social media realm, where people are perceived as just kind of creators of digital information and data. And we can just be very dismissive of people, very unkind to people, very judgmental of people. Uh, the, the whole concept of the canceling of people and the you know, unpersoning of people, the depersoning of people can happen just like that in a moment. And if that happens to you, if you find yourself on the receiving end of that, don't defend yourself. Don't defend yourself because all that really... Now, listen, if it's a, the kind of accusation where a, a, an actual question is being asked of you, a sincere question is being asked of you, fine. But this is trolling, Right? This isn't sincere. This is just pure trolling. The questions about the dubious nature of Jesus' birth. I mean, it's funny. Just as a case in point, I've had people say to me over the years, several people say, oh, you know, you're, you're some televangelist, you know, probably making a lot of money on the side. Yeah, you, you've got a lot of money coming in. And whenever somebody, may, whenever somebody makes the accusation against me that I am in any way, anybody that knows me knows that m money is I'm actually so unmotivated by it that it actually doesn't even really factor into the way that I do life. And, you know, sure, I'm driving a 1999 Nissan Pulsar and, and uh, living in a friend's house. Like, I, listen, I need to eat like you need to eat. And I'd like to have, you know, an iPhone that works and a computer that's... But money? So when people have raised these accusations against me, I'm not going to defend myself. Like... My personality, my character, and the people that know me, actually know me and spend time with me, my relationship to these things is a matter of public record. So to enter into a dispute of that nature with someone would be to legitimize, at some level, the concern. No, no, I'm not doing that. No effort to defend. And again, particularly with regards to social media, if people are trolling you, ignore them. Leave them alone. Don't, don't play that game. I just wanted to say a quick word about that because I really like that. Okay, jumping down now to, oh, this was a great point. Jumping down now to the paragraph that begins, never by word or deed. Never by word or deed did Jesus lessen a man's obligation. Okay, notice this. This is great. Uh, just a sentence or two later. When on earth he commended the poor woman who gave her all to the temple treasury, the widow's mites. Remember that? But... The apparent zeal for God on the part of the priests and rabbis was a pretense to cover their desire for self-aggrandizement. The people were deceived by them. Now listen to this. The people were bearing heavy burdens which God had not imposed. Even the disciples of Christ were not wholly free from the yoke that had been bound upon them by the inherited prejudice, key word there, and rabbinical authority, now by revealing the true spirit of the rabbis, Jesus sought to free from the bondage of tradition all who were really desirous of serving God. That phrase there, the bondage of tradition. Jesus, okay, this has got the chapter that we just had a few chapters ago that I did with Ty Gibson, the invitation, written all over it. Remember? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And we talked about how one of the, the efforts that was, uh, you know, one of the efforts that was afoot within the context of rabbinical Judaism was to make the strictures heavy and to make the requirements intense so that it was hard. And the more heavy you were, the more requirements that you had, the more rules and strictures that you had, supposedly the more pious and holy and separate you were from them. Jesus says the opposite. Jesus actually says here that that yoke, that way of viewing reality is a burden and, and he's trying to free us from that way of doing reality. 
right? And, and he says, take my yoke, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And Ty made that great point, which is awesome. The reason that the yoke of Jesus is light is not because Jesus is laissez-faire about life and morality and things that matter, it's because Jesus is bearing the way. Because Jesus is doing the heavy lifting, right? In the rabbinical schools, in the rabbinical structure, it was you, you better get your act together and I saw you, you didn't wash your hands and you didn't, and you didn't, this endless struggle with trying to keep the externalities of the traditions. And no, you can't do it. And so it was this yoke that was upon them. Fast forwarding to the book of Acts, Peter, in one of the great speeches in the book of Acts, will actually say, why are we, this is in Acts chapter 15, Peter will say, why are we trying to put on the Gentiles a yoke of requirements that neither we nor our fathers could bear? Okay, so this idea of a yoke comes up here and it's got chapter 34 written all over it. Jesus did not come to increase our load. He came to take our load, not to increase our burden, but to take our burden. Hallelujah. Oh, that's just too good. And so in in saying these kinds of things, Jesus is not only taking aim at the rabbis and the religious leaders and their spies themselves. He's actually saying all of this purposefully in the presence of the disciples and of the multitude so that their minds would be set free from these rabbinical traditions and this drama that really had no bearing on Torah as given by Moses. Okay, so there's a a great deal of, of... strategy here again and again. Okay, then um, this excellent paragraph that begins hypocrites. Okay, page 461 of Types and Symbols, 398 of the original. Hypocrites, he says, addressing the wily spies. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain, they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. Listen to this. The words of Christ were an arraignment of the whole system of, of Phariseeism. He declared that by placing their requirements above the divine precepts, the rabbis were setting themselves above God. Now, just very briefly, Jesus has already addressed this in the Sermon on the Mount. You might remember that. I don't even think we made mention of it. But in the Sermon on the Mount, when we read through that, when we read through that in our chapter here, one of the things, one of the most pointed things that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter seven, verses 21 to 23, Jesus says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, but he that does the will of my father, which is in heaven, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, we did this and we did this and we did this. And I will say to them, I did not know you. Okay, let me, let me just make this very clear. That Sermon on the Mount Section there, 7, 21 to 23. And this section here about the eating and the washing all has to do, and Jesus makes this point, between the external versus the internal. External compliance with religious requirements versus internal transformation by the love of God and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. External versus internal. External versus internal. Right? And the whole system, she says, the things that Jesus was saying here were, was laying the ax to the root of the tree for the whole system of Phariseeism, which was primarily external conformity to religious requirements. Okay, now here's the point. External is not unimportant, but external divorced from internal is an affrontery to God and an abomination in his sight. That's what he says. I'm not even going to know the people that externally their words were, oh, Jesus, Lord, but internally their hearts were far from me. He says, no, what Jesus is after is internal transformation. And yes, of course, internal transformation will lead to conformity with God's law of love. Not all of these strictures and traditions and precepts that were invented by men. She actually calls them human inventions. No, but when the internal is converted, when the spirit of God dwells in us, we will have an external conformity to the law of love that God has given, which of course is supreme love for God and authentic love for our fellow men and women that inhabit this planet. Yes, yes, we should be living like that. We will be living like that when the internal has taken care of it. And this is the point that Jesus makes. Um, She then goes on to say, uh, to the multitude, this is the next paragraph, or maybe two paragraphs later, to the multitude and afterward more fully, to his, and more fully to his disciples, Jesus explained the defilement comes not from outside, but from inside. Purity and impurity pertain to the soul. Purity and impurity pertain to the soul. 
It is the evil deed, the evil word, the evil thought, the transgression of the law of God, not the neglect of external man-made ceremonies that defiles a man. Okay, so it's right at this point that I'm going to go back into Matthew and point out just quickly the Matthew account. When they dug this pit for Jesus that they themselves then fell in, Jesus actually accuses them not only of the violation of the fifth command with the Corbin thing that we discussed, but he actually says that he, he quotes the law. This is so fascinating. And if you've got your Bibles, you'll want to note this, okay? So um, I'm in Matthew chapter 15, verse 15. Matthew 15, 15. Then Peter answered and said, explain this parable to us, which is actually kind of funny because it wasn't a parable. It was just a teaching. But they didn't understand it. And then Jesus said, are you also without understanding? Like, this is not a parable, okay? Like, I'm just saying that the things that you eat don't defile you, right? The things that go into you is not the thing that defiles you with an unwashed cup or whatever. Now, we're gonna get to the point here in just a second about the perversion and the gross misunderstanding of Mark chapter seven, verse 19. We'll just spend a moment on that. We'll be there in a second. But listen to this. Do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? Okay, that's key. All he's saying is you put something in your mouth, your digestive system, right? Even they knew that that food went in, did a bunch of spins and turns and circles and came out the backside, right? Exited out the back door. And Jesus says, you put something into you, it goes through your system and it goes out of you. Now listen to this. But the things that proceed from out of the mouth come from the heart and these are the things that defile the man. And he quotes, he quotes from the 10 commandments. Did you notice that? Maybe quotes is the wrong word. He alludes to, he identifies the 10 commandments. Listen to this. Verse 19, for out of the heart, the evil unregenerate heart of unconverted mankind comes evil thoughts, murders, sixth command, adulteries, fornication, seventh command, theft, eighth command, false witness, ninth command, and blasphemies. So you see what Jesus just did there? Not only did he discuss already the fifth command, which was the dishonoring of the father and the mother, when Peter comes to him and the other disciples say, hey, can you explain this to us? He says, it's not the thing, that, oh, you ate with an unwashed glass or you, you sat at a couch or a table that a Gentile had been sitting at before and hadn't been sufficiently you know, purified or cleansed. Jesus says, are you kidding? That goes into you, it goes through you, and it goes out of you. He says, but the stuff that comes out of you, and then what does he do? Quotes the commandments, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Quotes the commandments. He says, that's the stuff that defiles you because that defiles your soul. Okay, so this is why this chapter is all about a conflict between the external requirements of traditions and religions and, and religious precepts and the law of God, which is a law of love. Yeah, you have the 10 commands, the 10 commandments, which reduce down to you've got 10 fingers and two arms. So here's your two arms. One arm is supreme love for God. Supreme love for God. That's the first, well, supreme love for God, your creator, and then your parents as procreators. That's the first five commandments. Right there, there's your arm. And then the other commands are authentic love for people. You don't murder, you're not stealing, you're not uh, taking their spouse you're not bearing false witness. You're not coveting their goods. So now watch this. You got the 10 that reduce to the two that reduces to the one. So we got one trunk, two arms, 10 fingers. And the one trunk, Paul says and Jesus says, Paul makes it ex expressly clear in Romans chapter 13. All of the law is fulfilled in one word. One word, love. Supreme love for God, authentic love for our neighbor, love and service as manifested in the 10. Okay, you got the 10, the two, and the one. And what's happening is, is that the 10, the 10, the two, and the one are coming into conflict with what? Inventions of mankind. And not just coming into conflict, because a word on that. There's nothing wrong with tradition. There's nothing wrong with tradition. In fact, I, I forgot, I was gonna tell you a story. Early, early on in my, in my Christian experience, I mean like early on, like months after maybe within the first year of my conversion. The restaurant that I had received the great controversy in was visited by all kinds of people, wonderful people, beautiful people, local business people and hairdressers and punk rockers like myself. And, and at lunch, it could just be so busy. People were waiting in line because Mary's food was so phenomenally good. People were waiting to get in. 
And one of the groups of people that ate there, there was a, a delegation of oh, probably four or five Catholic priests that would regularly come in and eat. And um, Mary, being the amazing woman that she is and amazing follower of Jesus, she befriended everybody. Everybody loved Mary. A lot of people called her Mama Mary. That's what I called her, Mama Mary. She was an amazing, she was literally a mother in that community. Amazing. Exactly what followers of Jesus should be. She still is that today, but she now lives in Ardmore, Oklahoma. So, so one, one of these Catholic priests was somebody that Mary had actually gotten to know and spend time with. And they'd, you know, she and Tom had gone out to, he had like this like retreat. He was a monk, actually. He was a monk and a priest. And uh, they had this like um, monastery out in the Black Hills and he'd visited. And anyway, they were friends. They were friends. And Mary, who's ever ambitious, ever trying to get people to study the Bible, she said, you need to visit with my friend David. He, you know, and I was like a brand new Christian, like one year in. And uh, so she set up a lunch appointment with this guy because I was just poor. I was just reading scripture, just scripture, scripture. And my, my mind was like, and I knew a lot of stuff, right? Like, I mean, I was not wise yet. You can't expect, you know, old heads on young shoulders. I was only 24 years old, but she's like, oh, you'd love my friend David. You need to meet with him. So one day we sat down, me and this lovely Catholic priest. I've had several very interesting experiences with Catholic priests over the years. This was, this was my first one though, as a Christian. As a, as a new follower of Jesus. And he was there, so he was wearing all of his black and he had his little white collar and he was young, probably mid thirties. And we got to talking, we had a very lovely conversation. I was on the debate team, so I've always been very argumentative. It's actually one of the things that I wish I was less of, but I'm very good at arguing and debating and logic and, and can win a lot of arguments. It's actually not served me well, to be honest. Um, but, what happened was, is that we got in a little bit of an argument, but not, not, like a, not like an intense argument, just a little bit of an argument. And the argument revolved around tradition. Tradition. Because I was basically saying, hey, look, here's the deal. I just believe that scripture is over tradition, and you believe as a Catholic that tradition is over scripture. Or rather, they would say tradition is the interpreter of scripture. So it's just an epistemological difference, right? Like I think scripture, all tradition should be subordinated to scripture. And you think that scripture is interpreted through the lens of tradition. We were having actually a fairly genial, vigorous, but friendly conversation back and forth. And at one point he made a really good point. He said, look, not all traditions are bad. And I was like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's, that's, that's actually true. There are, there are traditions. Families have traditions. Cultures have traditions. Individuals can have their own traditions. Tradition in and of itself just means the way that you do things. Oh, we've done it this way for a long time. This is how we do things. So I'll give you one example of a, a little tradition in my family's home. Um, we, Violetta makes amazing vegetarian sushi. And we put like, this amazing tofu that she makes. She bakes this tofu and it's just incredible. And we put cucumbers and avocado and carrots and she makes this little um, uh, dressing that we put on it. We've got cashews and lemon and it, she, it's amazing. And, and it's, we eat this on Friday nights in our home. It's just the thing that we do. Our Friday night meal to open Sabbath because it's one of our favorite meals. And it's just fun to, you get together, you're making your own sushi because we're a very competitive family. We're always like, who made the tightest roll? Whose sushi looks the best? Hint, hint, it's um, Violetta. Always, <laughs> always looks the best. But the boys and I compete for second place. So this is a tradition in the Asherick household. And it's okay. God does not in any way look down upon that tradition and say, oh, that's got to go. Because that tradition does not run at cross purposes with the law of God. So tradition, fine. Nothing wrong with tradition in and of itself. And that Catholic priest that afternoon that we ate there in the vegetarian restaurant made a really great point. Now, of course, then my argumentative self came out and said, yeah, but many of your traditions in Catholicism actually do run at cross purposes with the revealed will of God in scripture. And we had a vigorous friendly, but, you know, ultimately, you know, we didn't, we didn't reach, the, the conversation ultimately we received, we, we reached no consensus because I'm a Protestant and he's a Catholic and we knew that at the outset. But here's the point. That's a good point. Tradition in and of itself is not a problem. 
Tradition's the way we do things. He actually quoted Paul. I don't remember the text right offhand, but Paul says, remember the traditions that I taught you. Paul speaking to Timothy. Interestingly, he tried to use that as a case in point for a carte blanche, sort of a blank check for all traditions. And I said, come on, come on, come on. That's not, I don't remember his name, Father Ron or something. I said, I said, come on, Ron, you can't use that as a carte blanche, you know, blank check for every single tradition that you could possibly invent. Paul is saying, remember the traditions that you learned from me. These were specific traditions that would have been, of course, in keeping with Paul's understanding of Jesus' life and the Old Testament. You know, we can't just open the door wide to any and all traditions. And we had a great conversation, but here's the point. What's happening with Jesus and the religious leaders is not that they have traditions. It's that they have traditions that are running against the current of the law of God. And that's where we have a problem. That is where the problem emerges. And so Jesus, when he's questioned about the defilement by Peter and the others later, he says, look, the thing that goes into you doesn't defile you because that goes into your stomach, takes a bunch of twists and turns and goes out of you. The thing that defiles you, and then he quotes the law. He quotes God's law of love, the 10, the two, and the one, right? He quotes the fifth commandment, the sixth commandment, the seventh commandment, the eighth commandment, and the ninth commandment. Fascinating. Did you ever see that before? Okay, now let's quickly address ourselves to back to the Mark account. And let's just quickly look at this verse here in Mark and then we'll wrap this up. I've not done a lot of this, but because we're right here, I feel like we need to just address it. So this is Mark chapter seven and I'll begin reading in verse 18. So he said to them, are you also without understanding? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Now, Let's just bear in mind context here. The context, no one is talking about eating iguanas or camels or bats. That's not in the context. Okay, the context of the passage is about eating food that has not been, eating from vessels that have not been washed properly and hands that have not been washed properly. So if we're going to remain in the context, we can't just now start importing ideas about clean and unclean foods and all of that. That's not what's happening here. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Verse 19, um, because, it does, because it does not enter his heart, but it goes into his stomach and then is eliminated. And then verse 19, thus purifying all foods. Okay, basically every single modern translation, and I looked this up this morning just to remind myself, I could not find a single modern translation that doesn't absolutely butcher this verse. And I've, I'm just gonna read you a couple of them right here. I'll move this so I can look at my screen here. Okay, um, uh, here's just a few modern translations. I got the NIV right here in front of me. Um, It says, just give me a second here. For it does not go into their heart, but into their stomachs and then out of the body. In this saying, Jesus declared all foods clean. Jesus declared all foods clean. The New English translation. For it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and thus goes out into the sewer. This means all foods are clean. Oh, does it really now? Um, Let's just go see ESV. That tends to be a pretty responsible translation, but they're gonna mess this up too, I can guarantee it. Since it enters not into his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled, thus he declared all foods clean. I mean, come on. Just come on. Stop it. Stop it, stop it. That is not what is being said here. Okay, let me just read you from the Young's literal translation. This is just the the literal text says this. I'll read it to you. It's quoted. It's actually translated pretty well in the um, New King James and the King James Version. Okay, here it is. Young's literal translation. This is the, the words, basically almost word for word from the Greek. Because it doth not enter into his heart, but into the belly and into the drain it doth go out purifying all the meats. Okay, the meats is a throw off there. It's actually not a good translation. Okay, I'm just gonna spend a little time on this so that you can, okay, almost every modern translation absolutely butchers this and way outside of the historical conversation and context, they just drop in this little line where Jesus is like, oh yeah, by the way, you can eat anything you want now. Iguana sandwiches, bat burgers, camel stew. What? What are you talking about? That's not what's even taking place here. The conversation is about ritual, ceremonial purification and keeping the buffer between us and them intact, right? So listen to it again, verse 19. But it does not enter into his heart, but his stomach and is, elim- into his stomach and is eliminated thus 
purifying all foods. Or, exactly as the Matthew account says, it goes into your mouth, into your stomach, takes a few twists and turns, out the back door and into the sewer, into the draught, as the old King James says. It means it's eliminated. It's purged out of you. But this idea that there's this parenthetical statement where Jesus, thus he spoke, declaring all foods clean. No, sorry. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. First of all, the word that's translated meat here in some translations, thus purifying all meats, is the Greek word broma. And I looked this up this morning just to make sure I had all my I's dotted and my T's crossed. The word broma occurs some 13 to 14 times in the New Testament. The word means food. It does not mean meat. It does not necessarily mean the word meat. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says that when the Israelites were in the wilderness and God was feeding, feeding them with the manna, they ate the same spiritual food, broma. Well, that was manna. That wasn't meat. Okay, the word just means food, number one. Number two, there is no contextual reason to just import and insert clean and unclean meats. It doesn't make any sense. That's second of all. Third of all, if this is in fact what Jesus was teaching, the disciples clearly didn't pick it up because Peter, later in Acts chapter 10, when the sheet comes down and he sees all these beasts walking through it, and he hears the voice three times, rise, Peter, kill and eat, rise, Peter, kill and eat, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, Lord, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Unclean is a biological distinction that we are, is found in both the Old Testament, in the Mosaic Law, but also even pre-Moses, going back into Genesis, right? The cloven hoof and, and the eating of the blood and all of that, okay? He says, I've never eaten anything unclean or common. Common was the thing that we're talking about here. In fact, very interestingly, when Peter says, I've never eaten anything common or unclean in Acts chapter 10, when the critique is leveraged against the disciples and against Jesus by implication from the spies, they say, why do your disciples eat with unwashed hands? Guess what word that is? Common. Why do your disciples eat with common hands? In other words, hands that are not ritually pure. So when Peter says, I've never eaten anything common or unclean, and this is years, remember, this is years after the full three year, three and a half year ministry of Jesus, public ministry, his death, burial, resurrection, ascension. This is like four years after that. So if in fact Jesus here is just like saying, oh yeah, you can eat whatever you want, everything's fine and good, and all that stuff I said in the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore, changed my mind well, Peter hadn't gotten the memo and John hadn't gotten the memo either because John, just a quick word on this. John, who wrote the book of Revelation, right? John the Re Revelator, when he describes Babylon the Great in Revelation chapter 18, he says that Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. And, it, and then it says, has become a cage of every unclean and hated bird. These would have been like vultures and condors and other things that were associated by the Jews with death because when something would die, these vultures would, would come there. It's a place of death is what it's saying. But here's the point. The book of Revelation is written like 80, 90 to 95, 96 maybe. So like 60 years after the time of Jesus, and this is key. When John's writing this decades after the life ministry ascension of Jesus, guess what? The word unclean still had meaning still meant something because he says Babylon the Great has become the, hage of, the cage of every unclean and hated bird. So here's the point, beloved. There is no way that within the flow of the narrative and the context and the actual situation that's on display here in Mark 7 and Matthew 15, you can extrapolate the idea that the distinction that God made in the pre-Jewish times, I cannot emphasize that enough, before Torah, before Moses, before Sinai, the distinction about the eating of blood and the eating of unclean animals. Remember, God said to Noah, Noah, of every clean animal, you bring seven, and of every unclean, you bring two, which tells you that centuries before God gave the very specifics about clean and unclean to Moses on Sinai, this idea already existed. Okay, so I just needed to address that there because most modern translations, and I've had to address this again and again and again and again in my evangelistic meetings, in my Bible studies, in my ministry, people say, oh no, Jesus said we can eat whatever we want. No, no, sorry. That is not what is being said there. What's being said is, and it makes so much sense in the flow of the context, in the flow of the circumstance, what you put into your mouth goes into your mouth, into your digestive tract, and out the back door, 
and it purges all the foods that you eat out into the draw. So Jesus is saying, these ceremonial uncleannesses and contaminations that you're so worried about, that doesn't defile you. The stuff that defiles you is the garbage that comes out of the unregenerate human heart. And then he gives that list there, right? The, the stuff that defiles you, I'll do the Mark list because I already did the Matthew list. The stuff that defiles you is this kind of stuff. The stuff from within, uh, he says, what comes out of a man defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. Notice, remember, law. The law is quoting the Ten Commandments over and over again here. Theft, covetousness, wickedness. In fact, covetousness, he quotes the Tenth Commandment there, right? Tenth Commandment. He said, all of that's the stuff that defiles you. And, and in the context of the larger sort of takeaway here is having all of these religious strictures and religious externalities without internal conviction, transformation, conversion, meaningless, worse than meaningless because you can deceive yourself into thinking, oh, I'm super pious, I'm super religious, I'm super close to God when God says, yeah, no, actually, I don't know that. It's not that God is unconcerned with the external. It's that the external is absolutely necessarily subordinate to the internal transformation of the human heart that comes how? By believing, by believing, by believing, by the gospel, and then the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And then we live a life, of course, by his grace, by his goodness, and by the infilling of his spirit that is in keeping with the great law of the 10, the two, and the one. That's what's going on here. Not some random statement about eating iguanas and camels and bats. I mean, come on. It's just, it's irresponsible Bible study to just throw that in. Now, sorry, not there. That's what's called eisegesis as opposed to exegesis when you just read into the text something that is not there. is making stuff up because we want to eat our bacon, right? So, and I'm not eating that stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not about it. No way. I mean, I'm a vegetarian, so I'm a different, different kind of fella. Okay, so what's our word here? What's our word? I want to see some of your words, and then we'll do the rubric. What were your guys' words here? Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Looking for some words. little lag. What was your word for this chapter? Tradition. Ooh, unfettered, says David. Oh, I'd have to give that some thought. I like that. Yoked. Great word, Maria. Encumbered. Oh, good job. Good job. Numberless. Oh, ooh, I like that. A lot of good ones here. Blind. Hey, that was my word from two chapters ago. Vain. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines. Planted, says Maria King. Intention. Good word, Deb. TL uh, Hand says customs. Encumbered is another one. Substitution. Haven't seen my word yet. Heart. Good one. Ceremony. Good one. Another unfettered. Great word. Substitute, oh, Deb's got my word. Deb star C, that's my word as well, uprooted. Some more here, customs, imposter, truth, heart, authority. Oh, good word, Cassandra, I like that. Revere, bondage, ooh, yeah, yeah, I can see that. I really like several people said unfettered there. I hadn't thought of that one, but I actually really like that. My word was uprooted because when Jesus Three times she quotes Jesus here as saying, every plant, in the context of both of these passages, Mark 7 and Matthew 15, Jesus, every tree, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. And what Jesus is doing here is he's not uprooting people. He wants to keep people rooted, but he's uprooting ideas that could threaten to deceive people and cause them to be self-deceived. And then they would later in the judgment be uprooted because they were living a lie. And so a little bit of painful uprooting in the here and now can prevent a really, really painful uprooting in the hereafter, in the judgment. And so Jesus here is plucking up ideas and notions and perspectives that are radically at odds with God's law of love and his character. And um, so that was my word, uprooted. And I really like that word. Interestingly, um, the week of prayer that I'm supposed to be doing right now, actually, at my son's academy had to be pushed back a week because of a COVID exposure. So it's supposedly happening next week, but I'm doing a four part series and the four parts because their theme for this year at my son's academy is rooted in Christ, rooted in Christ. And so I'm gonna do a four part series and the four parts are, I'm gonna talk to the kids about soil, roots, the tree, 
and fruits. And every one of those, soil, we're gonna talk about your environment. Roots, we're gonna talk about what are you anchored to. Um, uh, tree, we're gonna talk about identity. What kind of a tree are you? And then fruits, we're gonna talk about legacy. And so I'm really looking forward to that. And this verse really, this passage really popped to me today because I love the idea of uprooted. Uprooted, so I'm gonna incorporate that into the week of prayer that I do. So I'm really happy that it's uh, happening next week because I've got more time even to prepare. Okay, let's quickly do our rubric Um, the point, the person, the prayer, the practice, and then we'll pray for the power. Okay, um, what was the point of today's chapter? Well, obviously it revolved hugely around externalities versus internal transformation. Here's how I said that. To describe the increasing conflict and tension between Jesus and the religious leaders, yeah, particularly over the collision of their traditions and God's law of love revolving around internal versus external religion. Okay, that's what's going on here. Um, I wish Elise was here to give us one of those cute little one-liners. I'm sure she'd have a great one. Okay, what do we learn about the person of God here, the person of Jesus? That God is someone who cares far more about internal transformation than external conformity. God cares far more about internal transformation than external conformity, and the reason for that is the internal will always produce the external, but the external cannot penetrate to the internal. If it's only external, it'll actually deceive you into thinking you're pious and thinking you're religious when you're not. You're deceived, you're an actor. And so that's what we learn about God is that he cares more about the internal transformation. Think thief on the cross, right? The thief on the cross does not have opportunity for a lot of external, you know, <laughs> external religion to show itself, no. But he had an internal transformation and he recognized Jesus as Messiah and that, was enough. And it's enough for him and it's enough for you and me. He didn't sneak in on a loophole. He got in on the way that we all get in by putting our faith in Jesus, in his faithfulness. You! Okay, prayer. How do we pray this? Um, God, convert me in my innermost soul. God, convert me in my innermost soul inside of me. Amen. That's what I want. It just as a, I just, just a quick illustration here, very quick. You think about lust. We live in a very sensual, very lustful world. So, so there's the act of adultery, right? There's the act of any sexual act that falls short of God's ideal, which is monogamous, heterosexual, etc. So there's the act, but then there's the then there's pornography, which is like not the act, but it's mental participation in the act which also falls well short of God's sexual ideal. Okay, let's say that you're not having adultery. Let's say you're not even looking at pornography. Okay, let's just say that you're thinking about it in your heart, right? This is the point that Jesus gets to when he says, whoever looks at a woman to lust. In other words, the lusting has already happened and now you're just looking for an object of lust. This is very important. The the, the lusting is there, it's ready. Somebody wants to lust and so they look at a woman for the purpose of lusting. Okay, so that's that next level. Still, no, no, this falls well short of God's sexual ideal. And then you have learning to not lust in your soul, to not look at human beings, whether men or women, as primarily objects of sexual satisfaction for me. Right? It's, just a, it's just selfishness, right? It's just a sexual version of selfishness is what's going on here. So you have these layers of the act, the imagination of the act, or watching others do the act, the internal imagining of the act without necessarily the stimulus of pornography. And then they're like, no, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I wanna be converted in my soul. I don't wanna just be cutting off at, you know, these stages in my soul. God teach me how to not lust after people and after others and to view them as simply objects to satisfy my, um, you know, sensual desires. Okay, so, so that's what we want. And, and lust is just one example. There's many examples that could be listed. Not just external cooperation, right? But internal transformation. That's what I'm after. And happily for me, I'm married to an absolutely beautiful woman who is amazing in every way. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm deeply blessed. But I just use this as an illustration to say, it's not just external conformity, it's internal transformation. That's my prayer. And then practice, practice. How do we practice this? Well, I want to know and meditate upon God's law as a revelation of his character of love 
and to see it as a promise of human happiness and flourishing, not as a bunch of arbitrary restrictions. And I was going to spend some time talking about how God's law is not arbitrary, how it's rooted in love. And uh, we've just gone a little bit long and probably I'll pick that thread up at some point in the future. But God, teach me what it means, as David said of old, to meditate upon your law because I don't want to be uprooted. I don't want to be uprooted. But what I do want uprooted is all of the selfishness, the fornication, the adultery, the uh, murders, the anger, the covetousness, the, the thievery, all of that. I want all of that uprooted from my heart so that I'm not the kind of being person that will later in the judgment be uprooted from God's good earth. Something's gonna be uprooted. And rather than you being uprooted, it's far better to have Jesus uproot these things that he did not plant. And uh, I want that. And, and I don't wanna be deceived by some tradition tricking me into thinking that I'm actually what I'm not. Some, some piety persuading me that I'm really what I'm not. Okay, beloved, let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, it's been a great session here today talking about traditions and the internal versus the external and even some just good old-fashioned Bible study thrown in there. Father in heaven, I pray that you would uproot out of us, out of me, all of those things that are at odds with you and with your love, with your word, with Jesus' life as shown to us in the gospels. Father, forgive us where we have settled for that which actually brings about unhappiness and dissatisfaction and death. And Lord, may we never, ever, ever, ever substitute the externalities of religion to mask and to cover the fact that internally we are not transformed. Father, transform us internally. Transform us in our innermost souls. And then, Father, through that internal transformation that works its way out, may our external lives show forth your goodness and your love and your glory to the world around us. Father, that's our prayer And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, God bless you, everyone. That's day 44. Tomorrow we'll be back with day 45. It'll be at about the same time. We will be in chapter, is that, it's day 45, chapter 43. Barriers broken down. Chapter 43 tomorrow. I'll see you all tomorrow morning. Stay tuned to Instagram so you know the time. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and like and hit all of the buttons, that, that the bell that allows you to be notified. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Blessings.